Can you remember what you were doing on March 11, 2011? This was the day on which one of the largest earthquakes in history struck just off the coast of Japan, bringing with it a tsunami that led to a nuclear disaster rendering three nuclear reactors of the Daiichi nuclear power plant inoperable. I can still remember where I was and what I was doing when this was first reported in the news, especially when hydrogen explosions crippled three of the reactors, and I thought about the impact this incident would have on the world in the future, especially because of the radiation that started polluting the ocean since then. It was very much like September 11, 2001, which also had a lasting impact on the world, specifically involving humanity's freedom when it comes to traveling. We remember this earthquake off the coast of Japan not for its size or the fact that it caused a large tsunami, but for the resulting nuclear disaster that continues to pollute the world's oceans with radioactivity even today. What many may not realize is that this disaster also carried with it great prophetic significance, pointing to an event mentioned in the book of Daniel that would once again change the world forever, an event that happened exactly to the day nine years later. In this video I will show you how recent world events unlocked a prophecy that was given to Daniel regarding a period of 1290 days, and we will also look at the purpose of this period that has remained a sealed up mystery for more than 2500 years. At the time of posting this video fewer than 300 days remain of this period, and once you understand what Gabriel was telling Daniel, something that Daniel could not understand at the time this prophecy was given to him, one also obtains new perspectives on information shared in the New Testament, specifically regarding things that Jesus spoke about in the Gospels. So keep watching until the end as this video will blow your mind. If you are interested in seeing Bible prophecy being fulfilled, studying end time events and watching for the return of Jesus Christ. So what is the prophetic significance of the Fukushima nuclear disaster and what did it point to when we interpret it using the word of God? The Bible tells us that the waters or the oceans from a biblical perspective represent the nations or the peoples of the world, as can be seen in the following passage. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sitteth are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. Now if the oceans of the world are representative of the nations, what will the release of radiation into the oceans represent? And what becomes of the life that existed in those waters? Radiation will cause corruption. It will cause illnesses and tumors in organisms. And finally, it will cause the oceans to become desolate or empty. And over the past decade, we have seen the effects that radioactivity has had on marine life in the Pacific. Although media and science do everything in their power to deny these facts, or to shift the blame to something other than the truth, much like specific topics that affect the nations of the world today that are not allowed to be mentioned or discussed on social media. At a glance, one would also not be able to tell that there is something wrong with the oceans, as all would seem normal from a distance. But when one begins to look closer at the life in those waters, one may realize that what used to be a habitat in which all kinds of marine life thrived has slowly been turning into a graveyard. The emptiness that is brought about in habitats through the release of radiation would also seem to be related to a prophecy from the book of Daniel and referred to by Jesus in the Gospels. Jesus and Gabriel both describe an abomination that causes desolation or emptiness, and when we consider events that occurred during the Fukushima nuclear disaster at the hand of God's word, we are given an example of how humanity would be affected in the future, given that the waters of the oceans represent the nations and the peoples of the world. God's word also provides us with historic evidence for a similar event that occurred during the days of Noah, in which a flood was also involved, and which Jesus also mentions in Matthew 24. But as the days of Noe were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noe entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. In Noah's days there was a corruption of humanity's flesh on the earth, brought about by the fallen angels, and only Noah and his family remained perfect in their generation, meaning that they were the only people whose DNA were not corrupted. God saved them through the flood to repopulate the world. This corruption of human flesh was an abomination in the eyes of God, and caused the world to become empty. It was also the first instance in which an abomination that causes desolation is spoken of in the Word of God, given us a reference model for future instances. If we consider the Fukushima nuclear disaster from a biblical perspective, the prophetic message once again points to the corruption of all flesh on the earth, which at the hand of this nuclear disaster we understand to be permanent and irreversible. The Japanese authorities have tried to put measures in place to limit or restrain this process through which contaminated water enter the Pacific Ocean. By collecting as much of this contaminated groundwater into storage tanks as possible, but they are now planning to release this water into the Pacific in the spring of 2023. Even though this will have a massive impact on the world, this does not really seem to be thought of as newsworthy as one has to search out information on the subject as news about this does not make it to the main media streams. According to this article dated November 19th of 2022, the International Atomic Energy Agency stated that it is Japan's decision on whether to go ahead with the release of the stored radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean or not when spring of 2023 arrives. Although Japan has done all it can to remove radioactive particles from the stored wastewater, there are certain radioactive particles such as tritium that cannot be removed and this will impact the oceans, marine life and eventually every living organism in this world for millennia to come if this world was left to continue for that long. However, we know that God's word shows us that he plans to do away with this earth and to create new heavens and a new earth that will last forever. And is it not interesting that the new earth will not have any oceans? And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. One also wonders if this planned release of contaminated water into the Pacific is not somehow connected to, or at least pointing to one of the judgments that were announced over the wicked in the book of Revelation, where we read the following. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. What has happened in the world over the past two years, especially as far as medical mandates are concerned, would seem to mimic what we have seen prophetically through the Fukushima nuclear disaster, where the oceans have been irreversibly contaminated with a substance that makes this habitat empty. The same has been happening to human flesh in people who have rolled up their sleeves and who have allowed DNA-altering substances to enter their flesh. I think by now, most who have been watching my videos will know about the hybridization qualities of the substances contained in the vials, that many have accepted into their bodies. Just as the Fukushima nuclear disaster started an irreversible process through which the waters of the oceans began to be corrupted, nine years later, exactly on March 11, 2020, everything changed again, but in this case, a process started through which the flesh of humanity was impacted. This was the day on which our daily lives were changed forever and when lockdowns were instituted. March 11, 2020 would seem to be a key date from various perspectives. John from Theology Ed channel pointed out that March 11th was also a key date that was featured in a cryptic video from 2011. In this video, several number sequences are shown in connection with disasters that were caused by the secret societies of this world. And these probably all convey specific messages, but there is one sequence in particular 
that would seem to point to a series of events that played out just as shown, and this shown to us already back in 2011. This number sequence starts with 311, or March 11th, which in 2020 became the day on which normal daily life for the world ended. Following this, we have two more dates, June 21st and July 4th, that align with a solar and lunar eclipse that followed on June 21st and July 4th, 2020, respectively. And then the number 600 is shown. If we add 600 days to July 4th, it brings us to February 24th, 2022. Do you know what happened on this day? This, of course, was the day on which Russia's invasion of Ukraine commenced. Remember, our enemy wants to be like God, and the Bible tells us that he will go as far as showing himself that he is God, when he has set himself up in the temple of God. And having had centuries to plan the events that are now playing out, it should not surprise us when we discover artifacts such as these that would seem to be prophetic. The enemy is simply sticking to his carefully laid out plan, which he shows to the world a few years before certain parts of the plan are executed. And that is supposed to have the world think that he is like God. The God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, whom we as Christians serve, has known about the enemy's plan even before the enemy came up with them, and we are told about them in God's word, and can discover the mysteries if we listen to God's voice in our spirit. What is further interesting is that God's word tells us that when Satan sets himself up in the temple of God, that it has, once again, to do with an abomination that causes desolation. For many years, most have only considered a physically rebuilt third temple to fulfill this prophecy. But the Bible also tells us that our bodies are the temples of God, and that they can be defiled, just as the oceans are irreversibly corrupted when radioactive material is released into it. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. The temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. In Matthew 24, Jesus tells his disciples about the abomination that makes desolate, standing in the temple of God. And as always, we have to keep in mind that God's word has multiple layers through which it speaks to us. When we consider what Gabriel said to Daniel and what Jesus said to his disciples regarding the abomination that causes desolation in Matthew 24 and in Daniel chapter 12, we know that there has to be a dual application given Paul's explanation in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 about our bodies being the temple of God. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Notice that there are some differences between Gabriel's and Jesus' explanations when mentioning the abomination that causes desolation. Gabriel speaks about a daily sacrifice that will be removed, which Jesus does not specifically mention in Matthew 24. It is only inferred. It is important to note that the word sacrifice does not appear in the Hebrew texts, 
and thanks to my brother in Christ Ken Potter for pointing this out. What Gabriel was actually saying is that when that which happens regularly on a daily basis is taken away, in other words, when that which people would consider as normal life is removed, that should be seen as a starting point to a process. I believe March 11th of 2020 marked this day that Gabriel pointed out to Daniel. Gabriel also speaks of the abomination being set up, while Jesus refers to it as already standing in the holy place. From this we can deduce that Gabriel is referring to the start of a process, where one would set something up to have it standing eventually, while Jesus is pointing his disciples to the end of the process, where that which was set up earlier is now standing. We can clearly also see two applications in these passages. The first application would be an abomination that is set up in a physical building that would be known to the people living in Judea, also known as the nation of Israel at the time of the end, as the temple. Many expect that this temple will be constructed by the Antichrist after he is revealed to the world, and the reason for constructing a third temple would be to deceive Israel into believing that he is their Messiah. This physical object standing in the third temple is the first application that Jesus is pointing out to his disciples. The second application, I believe, was given to Daniel by Gabriel, and it was something that Daniel could not understand at the time this was given, as Gabriel told Daniel that the words given to him were sealed up until the time of the end. This shows us that Gabriel was probably pointing to an application that would require knowledge of our bodies being God's temple to interpret what was said. This could not be known until the Holy Spirit provided the key to unlocking this mystery to Paul. Having 2020 hindsight and knowing about the effects that the substances that were introduced into billions of bodies over the past two years have had on those bodies, and seeing how a nuclear disaster prophetically pointed in great detail to the events that have played out over the past two years, even providing us with a very accurate start date for this process, not to mention the enemy also pointing to the same date on which all of this started through predictive programming, I believe there is substantial evidence to show that Paul's version of God's temple being corrupted is now well underway, and for the first time we can understand what Gabriel was telling Daniel regarding the abomination of desolation as it relates to human bodies. Gabriel tells Daniel that from the time that normal daily life is taken away and a process begins through which the flesh of humanity will be corrupted, there will be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. What is somewhat frustrating, however, is that Gabriel does not tell Daniel what this period represents or what happens after the thousand two hundred and ninety days expire. He only says that those who wait until a thousand three hundred and thirty five days have passed will be blessed. Blessed is he that waiteth, and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. It is important to know that we cannot base our doctrines on a single passage from God's word alone, and that we have to consider all of God's word in such a way that our understanding does not contradict any passage in the Bible. As such, we can look at other passages from God's word to provide some clarification on the possibilities. If March 11th, 2020 marks the start of 1,290 days, what does this period represent and what happens after it expires? The first thought that may come to mind is that this could possibly be part of the first half of the tribulation, and that those who wait until the 1,335th day are those who are referred to by Jesus in the following passage. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Jesus said in the same chapter that those days would be shortened so that some flesh would be saved, as can be seen in the following passage. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake those days shall be shortened. However, we know that Jesus also said that great tribulation starts at the time when Israel flees into the mountains, and this is when those who live in Judea see the abomination standing in the holy place of a rebuilt temple. That would then require some time for the temple to be rebuilt, and this would also require the Antichrist to be revealed to the world which has not happened yet. 
In Revelation 11, we also read about God's two witnesses that will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And given that we have not seen them yet, and that this is a fixed time frame that is yet future, we can know that the period known as the tribulation that the entire world will experience has not started yet. We also know that the two witnesses are killed just before Satan shows himself that he is God in the temple of God when Israel flees into the mountains. And we can with some certainty say then that we are not yet in the 1260 days assigned to the two witnesses whose testimony matches the duration of the formation of the outer court of God's temple, which also represents the gleanings of God's faith harvest. Revelation 11 shows us that when the second part of God's temple is complete and has fixed measurements, which John is told to measure, the time of the outer court starts, and this is where the two witnesses will testify to the world. The three parts forming part of the temple and the harvest are models provided for us to better understand the first resurrection. And you are welcome to watch a series in which this is discussed in much detail, if you are interested. A link is provided in the description below. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. The period discussed in this passage from Revelation 11 precedes the great tribulation where God's wrath is poured out over the wicked, as it requires the two witnesses to be put to death first before great tribulation can begin, and where all of God's people, except for Israel, who will be protected in the wilderness during this time, have been removed from the earth. Also, when Jesus speaks about great tribulation, it would seem that he specifically points to this period as being the time to which the shortening of days will apply, to save some flesh alive at the end of it. I could be wrong, of course, but that would seem to be what Matthew 24 is showing us. These will be people, just as Noah and his family, who came through the flood that destroyed the world at that time, that will then repopulate the new earth. There are many other passages that one also has to consider, and I have pointed many of them out in some of the earlier videos I posted. But the question we are trying to answer is this. What do the 1290 days mentioned by Gabriel in Daniel chapter 12 represent? I believe the answer to this question is found in Jesus' explanation to his disciples in Matthew 24. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences, and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. All of the aspects mentioned by Jesus in this passage can now be checked off. Most of the world has been deceived by many who have claimed to be in the place of Christ, especially where it concerns our health. We are seeing ongoing wars and also how nations are rising against nations. Pestilences have been the focus of the world for the past three years, and this was also the main reason for normal daily life to be ended with energy shortages cleverly brought about by the enemy worldwide, crops everywhere being intentionally destroyed, and measures being put in place to limit the ability of farmers to produce food for the world, we can clearly see a severe famine that will soon begin to affect the entire world. There are, however, many signs that Jesus spoke of still ahead in the days that remain, that we have not seen at the time of this video's posting but that are still to come in the remainder of the 1290 days. Gabriel was telling Daniel about that which Jesus referred to as the beginning of sorrows when mentioning the 1290 days. What then would be the purpose of mentioning this to Daniel, who was a man greatly beloved by God? From what I can see, this is a message to those who are also greatly beloved by God, our Heavenly Father, who loves us with an everlasting love, and I believe the Holy Spirit inspired Peter 
to provide us with another key to understand the purpose of this period in the following passage. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Here we see how God's church is connected to a time during which God's judgment starts, and that this starts with His church. What Gabriel described to Daniel and what Jesus refers to as the beginning of sorrows align with a period of judgment that precedes God's indignation towards the wicked, that one would associate with God's judgment of the world, otherwise known as the tribulation. If judgment starts with God's church, when would the church be judged if they are kept from the hour of judgment that will come over the world? Please consider the following three passages that show us how God will remove those that He loves from experiencing any of His wrath. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. The beginning of sorrows would then seem to be a time of testing for God's church before our Heavenly Father's judgment over the world begins. It makes sense that the beginning of sorrows, or the 1,290 days mentioned by Gabriel to Daniel, serve to be a period during which our Heavenly Father tests His church to see who is loyal to Him and who is not. This period can also be compared to the time during which Nebuchadnezzar erected a golden statue that everyone had to bow before when the music played. For those who bowed before the statue, life continued as normal. For those who refused to submit to these instructions, severe testing and trials awaited them who preferred not to deny their God, and life for them in this world did not continue as normal. For those who stayed true to God during the past three years, who did not allow the enemy to deceive them, and who refused to bow to the mandates that the rulers of this world imposed on nations, life in this world has certainly been accompanied by persecution and hardships and many have lost their livelihoods, had to face uncertainties and deal with issues that could have been avoided if they simply rolled up their sleeves to accept the substances that change a person's DNA. When we understand this, we see how Revelation 3 would seem to speak to those who passed the test at the end of this period, after God judged His church. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Those who have passed the test have only a little strength that remains, showing us that it was quite a battle for them. But they have kept God's word and have refused to deny His name by trusting what the word of God says with regards to our bodies and our health, rather than trusting the so-called experts. We also obtain a new perspective on Jesus' description of his arrival on clouds in Matthew 24, when we know that he is now speaking to those that are greatly beloved by him, who has endured a time of testing as part of his church, similar to that of Daniel's three friends who would rather endure the flames of a furnace than to deny their God.
Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Many who do not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture love to use this passage to prove that a pre-tribulation rapture does not exist, because Jesus states here that immediately after the tribulation of those days, the events associated with the rapture will occur, implying that this has to occur after our Heavenly Father judges the world. However, when we know that Jesus may be speaking to those who are part of His church in this passage, who are being judged during the period that he refers to as the beginning of sorrows, it makes perfect sense that those who are being judged during this time would experience tribulation when they go through the beginning of sorrows, and that this does not negate a pre-tribulation for the world rapture. Also, the description that Jesus gives in Matthew 24 of coming with clouds, this being associated with the great sound of a trumpet, and his angels being sent out to the four corners of the earth to gather his elect, is associated with the passage in Revelation 14, where Jesus gathers in his harvest at the start of the tribulation, that the world and the unbelievers will experience, and Paul and Isaiah also describe the same event. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For the dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What those who use Matthew 24 to prove a post-tribulation rapture do not consider is that Jesus does not come on the clouds at his second coming. He comes on a white horse and is accompanied by his saints. He does not come to gather his elect at this point since they are already with him and accompany him when he returns to make war with the nations on the earth and to avenge the blood of those who were crying to him from under the altar in heaven, to avenge their blood. At this point, he does not send out his angels to gather his elect, because all of those who came out of great tribulation will and have to be put to death if they want to remain holy to God, according to the instruction given in Leviticus 27, verse 28 to 29. And they all gather under the altar in heaven. So there would be no need to send his angels to the four corners of the earth to gather his elect. There is no trumpet sounded at his second coming, but a sharp sword that proceeds from his mouth is described, with which he will make war against the Antichrist and those that follow him. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. 
and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can you see the discrepancies that some allow in their doctrine when they only use selected passages to construct a doctrine, without taking into account other passages that provide additional information on a subject? That is why it's so important to consider every word that was written in God's word, as this is the only way in which one can arrive at the truth. We are all fallible, and even when we do our best to construct a doctrine that aligns perfectly with all of what is written in God's word, we may still get some things wrong, but it is a far better approach than holding to a belief for which you can clearly see contradicting scripture. Many will also say that we should not consider the Gospel of Matthew as speaking to the church, because according to those who are leaving out some parts of God's word, and calling it rightly dividing God's word, Matthew was intended only for the nation of Israel. I will never agree with such an approach to God's word, because nowhere in the Bible are we instructed to focus only on certain portions of the word. Exactly the opposite is true. Paul tells us that all scripture was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that all of it is required to arrive at sound doctrine. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, Throughly furnished unto all good works. Many have shifted the focus of Scripture to the person who reads the Bible and that person's qualities, instead of focusing on the person the Bible was written about. The Bible tells us that in the volume of the book we are told about our Savior, Jesus Christ, and some books may describe different aspects of Him to us with a different cultural flavor in some instances or perspectives. All of these are provided to us so that we can become more intimate with Him. Sometimes what is written to us could be interpreted on multiple levels. And even though Jesus may have been speaking to a Pharisee about something, that message may have an application on a deeper level to a believer. Any book that we leave out or even give less attention to when we read God's Word will decrease the level of intimacy that we have with our Redeemer and lead to doctrines that deviate from the truth. When we know that the Gospel of Matthew is telling us just as much about Jesus as the book of Daniel, and every epistle of Paul, we know that when Gabriel addresses Daniel, a man greatly beloved in God's eyes, and speaks to him about the abomination of desolation, people who are greatly beloved in God's eyes are once again addressed when Jesus speaks about the same topic in Matthew 24. Who are those that are greatly beloved in God's eyes? Are they not his elect? Those who have trusted in Jesus as being the Son of God and who have stayed true to Him during a time of testing, just as Daniel and his three friends stayed true to Him during their times of testing. Has the nation of Israel been tested over the past two years with regards to being faithful to their Messiah? They don't even know who He is at this point. Can you see how it is then essential for believers to understand that Jesus is addressing His elect when he speaks to his disciples about the abomination of desolation and the time surrounding these events. Jesus' words were not only intended for Israel or his disciples in this regard, but addressing all of his elect in various sections of Matthew chapter 24. When we now read this passage from Matthew 24 again, can you see how Jesus is actually speaking to his church, who is greatly beloved? and currently going through a period of judgment known as the beginning of sorrows, with associated testing and trials. Those who are members of his church can choose to endure, just as Daniel's three friends chose to rather be thrown into a furnace than to bow before other gods, because they loved their god and would rather die than to obey orders from world rulers that would have them deny their god. 
God is now judging his church to see who is true to him and who falls down before the golden statues of the world when the music plays. And it is sad to say that many who call themselves Christians have not given it much thought when they bowed before the gods of this world, just so that they could avoid the persecutions they may have had to otherwise face, keep their work or in some cases roll up their sleeves just so that they could continue to travel. Some even believe that it is fine to bow before other gods when you have received salvation, believing that it is not God's will for us to suffer and that salvation cannot be lost, even if you deny God after you are saved. They fail to take into account what God's word says about the matter. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. I know this video has been rather lengthy, but now we come to the very interesting part where we look at what happens at the end of the 1290 days. If we consider the start date of this period known as the beginning of sorrows to be March 11th, 2020. The date that we arrive at when we add 1290 days to March 11th, 2020 is September 22nd, 2023. September 22nd lands on the eve of the fall equinox, and if we look at TorahCalendar.com, we see that this would position this day shortly after the Feast of Trumpets, three days before Israel will be celebrating Yom Kippur, and right in the middle of the Days of Ah. If we add another 40 days to September 22nd, we come to November 1st, which just happens to be the 17th day of Heshvan, or the 17th day of the second month, or the day on which the flood came over the world during the days of Noah. If we use the pattern that was provided to us by Jesus' 40-day ministry after his resurrection, which is also known as the early rains, these 40 days between September 22nd and November 1st could very well represent the time of the latter rains that will be poured out over the harvest to prepare the gleanings of God's harvest for their persecution by the Antichrist just as the early church was prepared by Jesus and those who were resurrected with him for 40 days to endure their persecution. Knowing now that Jesus spoke of the beginning of sorrows as a time of tribulation for his end-time church, who would be judged before his wrath is poured out over the world, we see him explaining events that occur immediately after the 1290 days in Matthew 24. If 2023 is indeed the year, then the events that he describes would seem to fit in perfectly with what will actually play out. Please consider what Jesus said in the following passage. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Jesus says that immediately after the tribulation of those days, days of testing during which his end-time church will suffer, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give her light. We just happen to see two eclipses directly following the end of this period, with a solar eclipse on October 14th and a lunar eclipse on October 28th, just before a possible repeat of Noah's time frame that could again start on the 17th day of Heshvan on November 1st of 2023. Our enemy also has his eye on October 31st, which in 2023 would be the day before the 17th day of Heshvan. And this has been shown to us in this image that appeared on the cover of The Economist magazine in 2016, where the date on which Martin Luther pinned his 95 Theses to the Roman Catholic Church door is incorporated into this image, where we see a tower destroyed by lightning and ten flames rising from the destroyed tower. The same imagery is once again displayed in the iPetco 2 animation, where a building that would seem to represent a mosque in Kiev is destroyed, and where ten black birds then rise from it. I'm of the opinion this date is important to Satan, not only because Halloween is his holiday, 
But he is also showing the world that this is the time at which the ten Nephilim kings that are spoken of in the book of Daniel will emerge. God's word shows us that before the Antichrist can be revealed to the world, the restrainer has to be removed. And by what the enemy is showing us through predictive programming, the restrainer would have to be removed around this time for the Antichrist to be able to step onto the scene. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders." and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Satan has also shown us his intent in the I pet goat animation to start a war that involves Islam on a date when a lunar eclipse occurs. This would then probably be the war that Albert Pike referred to as a mutually destructive war between Islam and the political Zionists that he wrote about in a letter to his colleague Giuseppe Mazzini in 1871. The plan may be to get this war underway on October 28th, three days before a new storm affects the entire world. In Matthew 24, Jesus says that immediately, after 1,290 days expire, there would be two eclipses and after these, the stars will fall from heaven. And this would put the stars falling from heaven right at the time of Halloween, which follows only three days after the last eclipse. Could October 31st be the day where Satan falls as lightning from heaven and is then confined to the earth? Jesus then states that once the powers of heaven are shaken and the stars fall to the earth, that the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. And I find it very, very interesting to see that the Torah portion that Israel will read at the end of this week will be Vayera, which means, and he appeared. This will then seem to be the time during which the world will realize that the tribulation, where God's judgment over the ungodly, will begin, especially when they see a clear signal in the heavens. I believe this heavenly sign will involve a collision between Jupiter and another celestial body, in which a third of the planet Jupiter will be removed, and I explained this in the very first two videos I posted on my channel. If our understanding is correct, and if 2023 is indeed the year during which all of these events will play out, then Gabriel's words to Daniel include an additional 45 days after the completion of the 1290 days, and that those who wait until November 6th of 2023 would receive a blessing. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and five and thirty days. I do not know what this day represents, but we know that if we are still around at that time, that Revelation 3 verse 8 to 11 will probably apply to those who have been faithfully waiting on the Lord, and who have endured the persecutions of the enemy, and they will receive a blessing and a crown for their perseverance, for keeping God's word and for refusing to deny His name. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. With everything considered, it would seem that the kick-off event for transitioning into the tribulation starts on September 22nd of 2023. And if you have followed my channel for a while, you will know that I have pointed out on many occasions how our enemy has overwhelmed us with predictive programming that points to September 22nd, and more specifically September 23rd. 
If you have not seen some of these videos, I can recommend these two videos in which a coming storm and September 23rd is highlighted through predictive programming. One of the most prominent clips in which September 22nd is pointed out to us by the enemy is probably this one from the movie Evan Almighty. Until September 22nd, midday. And if the arc isn't finished by then, you will be. Is that when it's going to happen? September 22nd, midday? By temperatures tomorrow back into the 90s, everywhere right on through Tuesday. In some of my earlier videos, I have referred to a prophecy that was shared by Ken Peters, in which the November 1st date is clearly mentioned. When I now listen to this prophecy again, and know that it very likely concerns the beginning of sorrows and our Heavenly Father addressing His Church about this period, it makes a lot of sense because much of what was said about this time frame would seem to have played out and continue to play out, with some of it still remaining in the days that are left. That is why it is so important not to discard prophecies when we do not see them fulfilled in a year that we think they must apply to, even if the person who shares them associate a specific year with them. Listen to God's voice in this regard and do not let the naysayers rob you of God's blessings and warnings. The same is also true for the calendar dream that Pastor Dana Coverstone has had. Both of these point to November of some year, with three years preceding it, to be the time of great upheaval coming over the earth, and God separating His elect from the world at this time. Since we have now passed November of 2022, we know that these prophecies did not apply to 2022, but as diligent watchmen, we have to consider every possibility, even if they turn out not to be valid. Given the information discussed in this video, we can now clearly see how 2023 is lining up to bring a fulfillment of what is spoken of in many books of God's Word. I could also be wrong, and what I am showing you is simply what I believe our Heavenly Father has revealed to us in His Word. But my interpretation of the information could still be wrong, and our Savior may remove those who have stayed true to Him before the end of the 1290 days. So it is important to be ready at any moment, even though there is a possibility that we may have to wait until September of 2023. Whether my understanding is correct or not, I know that many may experience some discouragement when thinking about the prospect of having to wait until September 2023 to see how things turn out. Remember that God is testing His church's conviction and patience, and if you endure until the end, steadfastly proclaiming His word and not denying His name, even though it may seem impossible to achieve from a human perspective, you will not only be blessed but also receive a crown. So stay strong and do not bow before the statue when the music plays. If our Heavenly Father saved Daniel and his three friends from assured deaths, he will also do it for us who are greatly beloved in his eyes. Remember the following passage that also applies to the times that we live in. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. If our Heavenly Father shows me anything that may point to an earlier departure, I will post a video about that, but from what I can see currently, September 2023 is the time that we have to keep our eyes on. I close with Ken Peter's prophecy again, and in light of the understanding we have now received with regards to the period known as the beginning of sorrows, and everything that occurred in the world since March 11th, 2020, please consider again what our Heavenly Father says to us about this time, keeping in mind that He is addressing His church about their time of testing, and where some events such as the upheaval of all nations, and the day of separation which is associated with November 1st, still remain to be fulfilled in the future. Please also share this video with others. I have provided a link in the description below where you are welcome to download the video and share it on social media with others. Please just leave a link in your description that points to this video so that viewers can watch some of the other videos mentioned in this one. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless. You have heard my word many times. You have heard my scriptures speak to your hearts. 
and yet you have heard this one over and over. But I say to you today, it shall be alive in your hearing. For I, the Lord, will send you help from the sanctuary. Yes, I say I will send you help from the sanctuary, from the holy place of my habitation. I have sent out international angels, heavenly hosts that will begin to make you strong again. For my people and my church, those of a remnant, have been in a severe testing and trial. For I have been preparing them for eternal things to come. And many would say, Lord, why, why, why? But I am saying that I am preparing you for an eternal weight of glory. That blows me away. So that when you put on the robe of righteousness and stand before my Son, that you will know that truly you have done well. That you will not think you got in by the skin of your teeth, but you will know that you served the King well. You know that you overcame. For did not my son say seven times in the great revelation to John that those who overcome, 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 shall they not rule and reign with me? Is this not your destiny? Is this not what each and every one of you are called to be and to do? So I'm telling you today that help from the sanctuary is being sent to you right now. That the journey will get easier. And that the battle, though it may rage upon this earth, that you will be strong and glorious. That you will be filled with might. That you will be filled with great faith. For truly my Spirit has chosen each and every one of you to be overcomers. But this is not automatic. This is not something that just happens. This is something that is the outpouring of your continual fight. And did not Paul say to you, fight the good fight of faith? I am strengthening your arms today. I am strengthening your feeble knees. For some of you today, those sins that have easily beset you are being removed. They're being pushed away. For I, the Lord God, have chosen you as a special people. This is Jubilee. I have chosen you as a treasured people. But more than that, I have chosen you to be a feared people. And the fear of my name will fall upon my church again. And this earth and its inhabitants will know that I have rose up mightily among my own. O gathering, O jubilee, says the Lord, be strong in this hour. Do not shrink back from the trials, but face off with the adversary, knowing that I, the Lord, are raising your arms like Moses when Ur and Aaron lifted up his arms. Today, my angelic hosts are lifting up your arms. They're beginning to do things that you cannot do on your own. They're beginning to bring reconciliation and restoration. You will see a sweeping across America in the next three years. You will see staggering, staggering issues challenging lives. You will see great devastation upon your land and many foreign lands. For the wrath of God is beginning in the earth against the unjust, against those who refuse my good news. But my people, you are in a safe place. You are in a very, very safe place with me. You must not fear the upheaval of nations. You must not fear the moving of nations into the Middle East. You must not fear what is going to happen upon Israel. You must not fear what will happen to America. For in the midst of chaos, I, the Lord, rule. I rule in the midst of downturns. I rule in the midst of trials. For my people are special, and you must understand that I chose you above others. That when you responded to my son's atonement, that I made a special compact with you, a covenant that cannot be broken. This is not your hour of defeat, but this is your hour to rise up and be strong. Like a great shipmast in the midst of a terrible storm, shall you be unwavered and unmoving. And I will pilot each and every one of you as you surrender to the working of my Spirit. As you decree today, do you not believe that I have all these things for you? But you must be 
and obedient people to me. You must not give place to lip service. The things that I say in my word, you must do in this hour. Never forget my throne of grace. Even in your rebellion, my throne of grace will give you mercy and empower you to become those of a glorious nature. The Lord says, stop being distracted. I want distractions put away from each of you. For some of you, it's the amount of time you spend in things that are not eternal. Look at your lives, children, today. My Father is preparing great crowns of rewards. And very, very soon, I will be your soon coming King. But for some of my people, the day will catch them unaware. And they will not be prepared. And they will be like a man who went on a journey without food, without clothing, and came into a storm and suffered great loss. You must hear me, my children, for my spirit beckons each of you now. This is not a time any longer to give me 50%. You must give me 100, for you are called to be overcomers. You have been destined by my Father to sit with me, excuse me, to sit with the 24 elders and make great decisions and heavenly strategies in the new earth and heaven to come. Do you not see that you are called to things beyond this limitation on earth? Come on, my people. You must see into a new dimension. You must look beyond your trials and your problems. And the Lord says you must no longer be complainers like Israel. For the Lord says this world will devour the complainers. But those who are clothed with the fire of my spirit, they cannot be consumed. They cannot be moved. And shaken. Soon you will begin to understand the very power of your worship and how it shatters spiritual realms and breaks principalities' backs. For great darkness has been sent upon your land. For those in high civil authorities have given this nation over to the ways of darkness. But I, the Lord, will redeem my people. I did not come to redeem governments, I did not come to exalt nations. I came to covenant with the people that are called out. So be ye the called out ones, says the Lord, and make a fresh covenant with me today. Rend your hearts before me, all of you, regardless of how well you know me, or how long you've walked with me, or how deep you've gone with me, or how you've served me. This is a holy day, a holy day among you, that you will never forget as time progresses. As time begins to come faster and faster, you will look back on this day, the first day of this month, November. You will look back, even as the clocks were changed, and time began anew, and you will say, that was the day of a holy convocation, the day the Lord set me aside and chose me for a special work. Rend your heart, says the spirit of grace and supplication. The Lord says you have called times of prayer here. They must be adhered to by more and more. Some of you are ignoring the spirit of grace, and you find excuses and alibis with which to avoid spiritual depth. But a great tide is coming like a tidal wave that pulls people out to the seas, some of my people will begin to be pulled out to the sea and never return to the depth of their first love. Do not ignore the beckoning of my spirit this day. This land is being weighed in the balances. There must be great prayer. Prophets have come to you and spoken that your prayers will dictate the next three years. It is time you become a serious people. For Satan has desired to send scorpions and demonic beings to bite the people of God. To get them to doubt my goodness through a lack of separation. This is a day of separation, says the Lord. I called you to be a sanctified people. Come out. Come out from this world and be separate. Set aside these things that trip you up and do the things that make your Lord a Lord of pleasure for you. A master who smiles when he looks upon you when you work. No, your work shall never ever obtain your salvation. But your earthly works will determine the pleasure of the king and where you are in the midst of his presence. For some of you, the spirit of grace is saying, kneel. Others, he is saying to your hearts, lift your hands high and pledge your allegiance to the Lamb of God. Pledge your allegiance to the kingdom that comes. The Lord says, in three years, 
you will see the upheaval of all nations. I'm either the biggest false prophet that ever lived or I'm the stupidest prophet to ever say that. The upheaval of all nations, all nations in three years. If you've studied end time Bible prophecies, you know exactly what that's pointing to. It has to be the return of Christ. In three years, you will see the upheaval of all nations, and you will see that even national names will be gone forever. Some of you act as though these things can never happen in this modern era. But if you look back many times throughout the history of man, nations have lost their names, their influence. And these things are happening now, says the Lord. And you must be ready. And you must remember what Paul said to you that having done all to stand, you must stand with your loins girded with truth. Do not let deception come. Do not buy into lies. Remember what my son said before he departed this earth to sit at the right hand of my glory. He said, beware and let no man deceive you. Guard your hearts, my children. Do well and cause your father to release a great smile of his pleasure upon you. Go before him this day without leaders, without worshipers, and tell him, these are my areas, these are my things, these are my fears, these are my failures. And he will raise you up, for in your humility you shall be exalted. For in the, for in the end of times you will see the pride of man like never before. You will see the obstinance of men's heart, hearts, excuse me, contending for that which is bound for Gehenna. But for my people, as Isaiah prophesied, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord will rise upon you. <laughs>